Hello, I'm Gary Rhodes from Brigham Young University Marriott School of Management. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Today we're pleased to welcome Paul Wilson, founder of SecretShopper.com, a mystery shopping company. Paul is a graduate of BYU and the University of Minnesota Law School. And while at BYU, Paul and his business partner started the Happenings Coupons book. They also had a business law practice for the first several years after law school while they were growing the Happenings Coupon Books company. Upon the sale of the company, they started SecretShopper.com, a mystery shopping company. Paul now particularly enjoys mentoring small startups who are looking for a web presence and hoping to bootstrap the financing of their business. Paul and his wife, Ann, have been married for 38 years. They have six children and reside in Minnesota. The Rollins Center of Entrepreneurship and Technology welcomes Paul Wilson to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. So thanks for flying down. Glad to do it. And I, I'm assuming the weather, uh, it's a little warmer here than Minnesota right now. Tropical. <laughs> well, listen, uh, you, you've been a great supporter of Brigham Young University and the center, and uh, I know you started giving lecture series here in 2000. Is that mm -hmm. right? And I think uh, the audience and uh, the public would like to know a little more about you. So would you take a few minutes, tell us about your family? Sure. Okay. I was born in Salt Lake, moved to Minneapolis when my dad got transferred there when I was five. And I have basically spent all of my life in Minnesota since then. Um, I started college at the University of Minnesota, went on a mission to the French East Mission, came back, and at church, I met this girl home from her freshman year at BYU. She beguiled me, made me transfer out to BYU. <laughs> and uh, well, we got married, uh, graduated from the Y, headed back to Minnesota, went to law school at the University of Minnesota, and have lived uh, continuously in Minnesota ever since. And you have had how many children uh, graduate here from BYU? Well, we have six kids. Okay. Uh, five of them have graduated from BYU along with their spouses. And then our, our youngest is a senior over at the business school, although she's currently serving a mission in Hong Kong. Oh, great, great. You know, uh, as I've kind of looked at uh, the things you've done, I think what's striking and interesting uh, to our audience today is that many entrepreneurs um, uh, they go after they graduate, they work in a corporation five or six years, they get some ideas, and then they go start up a company. But uh, you're a little different. You took another path, a riskier path, some would say. You went right out of uh, college into your entrepreneurial experience, in fact, started it in college. Is that correct? Well, that'd be right. And I think that's a lot uh, about what the Center for Entrepreneurship is about, okay. is encouraging students to, uh, to get involved, to think about doing something now. Um, back when we were students, uh, I'm not sure there was any sort of a program of this sort. And uh, in fact, I didn't know what the business school was. I was a psychology major. But one day during my senior year, uh, a very great friend of mine uh, came up to our apartment for a double date and uh, said, Paul, we ought to do a coupon book in Minneapolis. And I said, yes, and we'll market it through the high schools. And there we went. And it really changed things for us at that point. Uh, like a lot of our friends, we were planning on going to law school simply as a way to delay having to make a decision about life for another three years. <laughs> and uh, he was heading up to the University of Utah for law school. I was going to the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. But instead, we went to Minnesota, which was still a top 20 school, and began our business. Now, many, uh, how did you get this idea that, you know, let's do a coupon book, and you said yes so quickly? I mean, did you do a market study? I mean, how did that come about? Well, Brian was working uh, in Salt Lake uh, through a friend of his signing up uh, advertising participants in what was a radio advertising book, uh, a company coming in and selling a coupon book over the radio. Uh -huh. And down here at the Y, there was a Cougar coupon book that existed that had, you know, dollars off at various businesses in the Provo area to introduce students. and. I think that was probably what got Brian to say, and he certainly said it, very, said it very spontaneously, let's do a coupon book in Minnesota. And uh, the deal was closed seconds later when I said, and we'll sell it through fundraising groups. In high school, uh, I was involved in a lot of fundraising. I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I was always one of those guys that said whoever was going to sell the most product of anything, uh, I'd sell one more. <laughs> and uh, it just seemed like a natural yeah. fit. We said we'll do it, and then we started doing market research and business planning. 
for the remainder of our last semester here in Provo. Okay. So you were actually, so you started it while you were here, a senior? Were you a senior? Yes. Or, okay. And then you actually uh, did it while you were in law school, on the side? On the side, during law school. Really interesting. We went and, uh, and worked hard during the right. summer, and then uh, in law school it was, uh, it was close to impossible. Um, we, we divided up business responsibilities a little bit, and Brian took responsibility, primary responsibility for the compilation of the product. Mm -hmm. I took primary marketing responsibility. And whoever was the law student at the time, or not the business partner, so to speak, <laughs> made sure that the uh, other one was studying adequately um, and was up to speed. Uh, and then we just swapped those responsibilities. And, uh, you know, those were days when, uh, you know, we began at 6 in the morning and ended at midnight six days a week. And, you know, then on Sunday I was in the uh, branch presidency of the ward. So it, it, was, it was active. And, uh, you know, I, I think about that. And uh, actually it's not all that heroic because pretty much regardless of what you do early in your career, you've yeah. got to work hard to succeed. And, uh, and we did. It worked on both counts. Right, right. So, but it was more than just a Minnesota, right? I mean, you, you grew this organization from just that area to others, right? Yes. Uh, you know, we, we did Minnesota and we were growing the business. We were very much in the startup phase the first couple of years of law school. And uh, at one point, uh, after our second cycle of business, during our second year of law school, we said, whoa, you know, this has continuity possibilities we can use this to help us launch a law practice. And so at that point we started organizing a, a private law practice and positioning ourselves to uh, effectively do that in a way that would let us have maybe a little better uh, client mix than you might normally get hanging your shingle out. Right. Well, we get out of law school, we're practicing law out the front door, we're operating a coupon business out the back door. What a combination that is. Too. It was an interesting combination. <laughs> you didn't know if they were coming to a law practice or a, a, a coupon two for one or something at a hamburger place. Oh no, we knew. We had a nice front door and the back door was absolutely a warehouse. <laughs> but uh, we got to a point in time where uh, we'd worked hard enough, long enough, and we're making enough money that we said, okay, it's now time to get a little better work-life balance. Mm -hmm. And the law practice needs more focus now to, as it keeps flourishing, yeah. and the business needs more focus as it's flourishing. So we sat down and decided which is going to stay, which is going to go. And that's a really interesting story. Mm -hmm. But it ended out that we uh, abandoned the law practice, focused full time on the business, and said, okay, we've got to go to another market uh, so that we have the, some scale opportunities, uh, do some things more efficiently. Right, right. Well, that's great. I, I, you know, uh, Happenings Book is still a popular product in this area. Uh, our family uses it, so. Well, I appreciate We appreciate that. you uh, <laughs> developing that a long time ago. You know, it's an interesting thing. As an entrepreneur, there are a lot of things that are, are very gratifying to you. And even though uh, our businesses have been operated on a relatively small scale, uh, one of the greatest satisfactions of entrepreneurship is providing employment for people yeah. and helping people launch their careers. Uh, a second part of it is the tremendous uh, you know, flexibility that it gives you with your family life. Yeah. You still have to work hard, but you have more flexibility to be a, a room mother, to go parent-teach at conferences, to uh, coach teams, etc. Uh, and then, of course, the third element are the financial rewards. Right. But for the happenings business, we had a fourth. And the What's fourth that? one is, every car you go by in a parking lot has got a happenings book in it. Then you say, that's mine, that's yeah. mine, that's mine, and, and that's satisfying. Yeah, it, it's gratifying to, to uh, build something and to see people enjoy it and use it, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. It really is. So, uh, as you kind of reflect back, we have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs here today and in the, and in the viewership. And, and I think they'd like to know, you know, uh, you, you really demonstrated the, the kind of tenacity it takes to get a company off the ground. I mean, it was an idea, an idea that was uh, going on in other states. And you said, hey, let's, let's take it to where I'm going and develop it further. Uh, but as you kind of look back, what were kind of some of the lessons that you would suggest to these aspiring entrepreneurs, I mean, things that you would suggest, you know, four or five things that are critical for their success. 
Well, let me share an example okay. of a crisis that, uh, you know, that really hit us hard. And uh, for those of you that are watching this later on TV, after you hear the question, put it on pause and come up with your own answer for just a minute and see what it emotionally feels like to you. For you here in the class, I've processed this a little bit more quickly and it might help you see um, how you feel about entrepreneurship. Um, we marketed our product primarily through high school fundraising groups. And, uh, you know, every year there were competitors that came along um, and they all had impacts of various sorts. But one year, our second year, uh, we had our salespeople blanketing the high schools at the beginning of uh, teacher conferences, teacher preparation before the school year began. And uh, after the first day of sending our people out, they all come back to the office and they said, no one is going to sell our books this year. <laughs> they are all selling uh, this passport book. And, uh, you know, we said, well, does anybody have one? And one of our salespeople had, had picked one up. And uh, we learned a little bit more about this as, as time went on. But basically, uh, a fellow, a mailman, someone that had another career to back him up, had looked at our book and said, ah, that's a good idea. I can do that. And he went to all of our high school groups that had sold and said, oh I am going to do this. I'm going to do a happenings book next year. This year, the Happenings book is selling for $5. This is back in 72, so it's right. about the equivalent of a $25 product today. And he said, they're selling for $5 and giving you $1 profit. I'm going to sell for $5, and I'll give you a $2 profit. If my book's like their book, and I'm giving you a $2 profit, will you sell it? Oh. What do you suppose everybody said? Well, yes. Okay. They all said yes. And so he then went to them, and he said, I've got this form letter right here. Could I just put in the name of your high school, Hopkins High School Band? And would you just sign this letter saying, I sold the Happenings book last year. Next year, I'm going to sell the Passport oh. book uh, if it has the same kind of yeah, coupons yeah. in it. What do you suppose they did? They signed it. They signed it. Everybody signed it. They took this notebook around, and they went to all the businesses and said, we're doing the new Happenings book this year. <laughs> and everybody, it's always Happenings. You know, we right, became right. Kleenex or Xerox right away. And uh, they went to the businesses, and the businesses, you know, were afraid that they'd lose the business that we brought in. So right. they all signed up, and this book comes out, and it's got Burger King and McDonald's right. and Pizza Hut and the Twins and the Gophers and anything we had, they had. And uh, our people are out there trying to sell it $5, $1. And uh, they've already said, no, we're going to sell it $5, $2. So they come back to the office. They lay that news on us. And, uh, and we say, OK, things will be fine. Go home. And Brian and I will have it figured out. Uh, come on in real early tomorrow morning, because we'll have to tell you what we're going to do. Yeah, we want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, so how's your heart fluttering right now? You know, think about being my partner. Yeah. And, and now the, the first thing that we do is we analyze the product right. to see exactly what it is. And I'm not going to share that analysis with you right now. But then the second thing that we did is we had to determine strategically what we want to do. Okay, put this on pause. Strategically, we thought that there were basically two choices. Right. Choice one defend the market. Choice two, find a new market channel. Right. And we had to make a choice. Well, what choice do you make and how confident do you feel about it? We decided we were going to defend our channel. And so what we started doing was coming up with every possible pricing profit scenario and making some assumptions about what the what the sales volume would be based on that model mm -hmm. and uh, then determining uh, which would result in us making the most profit. And it was, it was those were interesting times back then. Uh, we didn't have computers to do it on. We didn't even have calculators to use. They weren't invented yet. It was still, you know, it was still done with yeah, an yeah. adding machine. Right. So we made spread spreadsheets and uh, put down every possible uh, combination we could come up with. And of course, you know, we'd never been in the business school. I was a political science major. He was a psychology major. We didn't know what we were doing. We call that sensitivity analysis now. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what it was. And we just use Excel. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't have it, wish we did. But anyhow, we came to the conclusion that we could raise our price a dollar to six dollars okay. and match their two dollars oh. in, uh, in profit. And uh, part of it related to similarities and dissimilarities in the, in the product. We developed a new uh, sales approach for our people to use. They came in the next morning, uh, we presented it to them, they went out, came back that afternoon, they had converted every group. And it's an interesting conversion because yeah. all those high school groups already had their boxes of books stacked on the floor from Passport. They pushed them aside. They took ours. Yeah, how? I mean, I'm, they were getting still two dollars. They just wanted to go with the known commodity. Is yeah, well, it was, it? it was a better product. Okay. You know, the two looked the same, but they really weren't. But we we just figured it all out. Yeah. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, very petty happy days uh, was when we finally saw this fellow uh, file for bankruptcy. He pretty much didn't sell any product that year because he had he had misunderstood what our product was. He was similar, but he was he was different. Well, yeah. how does the adrenaline run as you think about being told that uh, you know no one wants your product and you're being under underpriced? Uh, yeah, and also it was kind of an underhanded approach. It's good to see the good guys win once in a while. Yeah, <laughs> it was good to win. Yeah, well, great. Um, so kind of from that is that really it's, um, I think one of the lessons you're saying about is that when you start a company and you get competition, you really have to be very strategic. You know, you, you, you can't just react. I mean, you, you took a long time and, and looked at your opportunities and options, went through them thoroughly, and then decided on a, on a strategy. Yeah, it's, it's not just put a product up there and, uh, and, and just be glad and hope that it works. You really, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of mind power. Well, you have to be very courageous about the decisions you make because defending the territory might have been a dumb decision to make. You know, maybe instead we needed to say we're not going to go through high school channels, we'll go through other community groups and other right. kinds of fundraising groups because we need to stick with this $5 price. Right. I mean, there were some really tough decisions. And those sort of things repeated themselves constantly yeah. through the years. And of course, that was what all of our corporate fin friends were jealous of, and part of what we liked about being an entrepreneur. You know, you make the wrong decision, you get punished. Right. You make the right decision, you get very nicely rewarded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you, you ran a tight ship, right? I mean, because eventually uh, you grew this, and uh, uh, eventually sold it, right? It was a, a great harvest for you, and and you were the premier happenings group in the country. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little about that? Well, yes, I'll, I'll tell you two parts about it. Okay. Um, one, we didn't go into a lot of markets, uh, as things turned out. Uh, we, were, we ended out in three markets, one of the markets being here in, in Utah. And uh, as we came to Utah, uh, we actually needed a second market when we stopped practicing law. And we said, what would be a good market to come to? Do we want to go to a market that doesn't have a coupon book because they were not all over America yet? Right. Or do we want a market where there's already a product? And we decided we wanted a market that had a product that was being economically very successful, but was a very weak product compared to what we had learned and how we had developed through the years. Mm -hmm. And Utah met that to a T. Had a fabulous product from a sales point of view, but a great thing to be competitively measured up against. We ran our spreadsheets again, still no Excel, <laughs> and. Uh, we determined that we should try and buy their business for three hundred and sixty thousand dollars because it just we, we, we'd grow faster we'd hit profitability okay. quicker it was worth it to us so we offered them three hundred and sixty thousand dollars to sell us the business and they told us no um, we won't buy it and uh, you're not going to succeed here Utah's different you don't understand the market people are loyal to us blah 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 okay. and uh, you know we said fine okay and we came out to the marketplace anyhow. We had a very quiet first year and did exactly what we wanted to do. We got the base product put together. Right. We got a, a small presence, so there was awareness in the marketplace. Then we came back the second year uh, with a vengeance and uh, had a big impact in the marketplace, which impact set the stage for us to come back the third year and become the dominant player in the market and just about knock out uh, the former number one player. And instead of the, the $360,000 cash 
that we originally offered them, we ended up buying them for $20,000 down oh. and $20,000 a year for five years. Um, so, so one of the lessons we can learn is if we're in a market competing against you, take the first offer. Well, you know, <laughs> pigs get fat, yeah. hogs get slaughtered, yeah, and yeah. Uh, these guys just thought they'd, you know, right. they'd get more money. Well, you're very efficient. I mean, you, you really have a skill set that a lot of entrepreneurs don't it, detail, focus on detail. And a lot of people don't think entrepreneurs are real detailed-oriented. Actually, when you look at the companies and entrepreneurs that succeed, they're very, very detailed-oriented. And that's a good example. Well, you know, when you, when you talk about that, uh, that relates to another element that I think is important for entrepreneurs yeah. to consider. A lot of people like to do it alone, have their own thing, have their control. Mm -hmm. Some people like to do it as part of a big group. Right. Um, I've had one partner since we were 16. We were 16, we had our first business together, still partners today. Mm -hmm. And we bring very different skill sets to the picture, different levels of optimism and realism, um, mm -hmm. you know, different intellectual skills. The compliment has been very, very nice to help us have the complete package. I think the only thing missing would have been really nice if one of us would have known how to read a, you know, a balance sheet or a profit and <laughs> loss uh, when we started, but you know, you can overcome that. Let me go back and answer a question yeah. you asked a little bit earlier about okay. the acquisition of the business. Yeah. That was a fascinating process. In 1978, uh, a national competitor came to us and said, we're coming to Minneapolis and uh, we're the big guys, we're putting you out of business and you can have your choice as to how it's going to happen. It's very much a mirror of what took place in Salt Lake a few years later. Right. You can either sell to us at a certain price or we'll just competitively knock you out. And uh, we weren't convinced by them. Um, we, we fought them off mightily in the marketplace. And in fact, uh, they're coming to the market. Uh, our refusal to sell to them was what changed our business from being a good business to a great business. Because with the increased competition, we had to work harder. Um, and smarter. And much smarter. The businesses got, were better served, the customers were better served, the fundraising groups were better served, all of which meant we made so much more profit. Well, this national company kept expanding and acquiring players around the country, and we became a real thorn in their side because we were the number one uh, market in America, and we were distributing a volume just unmatched by what they were capable okay. of doing. And they tried to buy us again in, uh, in 1986, and they didn't succeed. But then finally, in 1989, um, they got tired of, uh, of being number two in the market and uh, they got tired of us and they came and, uh, and made us a very generous offer which, uh, which worked even better because a Fortune 500 company came along and wanted to buy us as well so we had a little bit of competition, uh, competition going on. And interestingly we, we sold to entertainment because they would pay us all in stock. And, uh, Ascendant, who uh, ultimately wanted to buy us, ultimately bought entertainment, they wanted to pay in cash. And I was adamant that I would only take stock because I didn't want to recognize a gain and I needed to do something with the money after we sold and I knew owning entertainment stock was a great thing to do. Okay. It worked well for us. Yeah, uh, what's, I know there's the rest of the story. Did the stock go up over the years? Oh, the stock went up. You know, <laughs> the, the acquirer of entertainment who acquired us was a top performing stock during the late 80s and, uh, and 90s and right. worked nicely for us. Good. Kind of a, well, it's obvious and, and uh, you know, your enthusiasm for, as an entrepreneur and your, your insights in that, but um, uh, give us an insight on the other side. We, we know Paul Wilson, the, the entrepreneur, uh, but uh, we also know there's Paul Wilson, the bishop and on the spiritual side. So I, I'm assuming a lot of your decisions were impacted uh, not only by temporal concerns, but spiritual concerns. Can you share something uh, with us? Well, very much so. Um, you know, we've, we feel like we've always behaved in an ethical manner, right. as hopefully any Latter-day Saint would. But the thing that I reflect most on upon the church as it relates to our business is the unfettered ability that we've had to serve. And as my partner and I have had various responsibilities in the church, uh, we have very much liberated each other to spend unusual amounts of time when the church has, has presented an opportunity to do that. And it's, it's been just a, a wonderful mix. And you know, a lot of people serve well in the church, whether they're employed or not, uh, or they're entrepreneurial. But the entrepreneurship has given us tremendous flexibility. And I think our families have paid maybe a little bit less of a price because of that flexibility. Yeah, that's great.
That's great. Well, we sure appreciate you coming down. We know the uh, students have a lot of questions for you and that, and so at this point in time, we're going to kind of open it up uh, to the students in the audience to ask questions, and uh, feel free to answer them. Uh, keep your answers or your questions short so we can, and speak loud so we can hear. Thank you. and you <laughs> don't practice anymore either? No. Uh, we started a small business practice right after graduating from law school. And because of the networking that we were establishing in the community, we actually had a very nice small business, real estate, uh, tax practice. And when we told our clients that we were closing down, everybody was really happy for us as long as we agreed to just keep them. But we closed the practice completely. It was, it was time to focus our energies a, a little more fully on developing the business. Well, oh, Paul, I have a question. I, I, most entrepreneurs, if you talk about law, uh, there, you know, there's not a real kinship there. Uh, you know, there's entrepreneurs and there's legal services, and, uh, and generally they're very costly to an entrepreneur. <laughs> Yeah. So how did you disentangle that? I'm just curious. Well, there are a couple things about it. Right. Loved law school. Right. You know, the, the intellectual stimulation of law school is, is just a fabulous thing. And uh, there are a lot of lawyers that are not practicing law, that it's just preparation for, for many wonderful things in life. Actually, though, going to law school while running a business uh, was really a, a very enriching thing because almost anything that was going on uh, in the classroom we had a context for it, right. and it was very useful to, to have that context. So that, that felt good. Um, but you know, when, when it came time to decide, are we going to go? Are we going to develop the law practice and uh, get rid of the business in some way? Or are we going to focus on the business? If I could simplify it, we basically said, okay, with law practice, we have no idea who's going to come in today and what their problem's going to be. But when we hear the problem, we'll essentially know the solution. And then it's just a matter of, of working the solution through and doing what's necessary. And that's OK. You know, that's intellectually stimulating, that, you know, working that through. But with the business, we know that we don't have a clue what the problem is going to be that walks in the door. Like, no one's going to sell the product. Yeah. And when we hear what the problem is, we typically have even less of an idea of what the solution is. And that is really exciting. And then beyond not knowing what the solution is, if you come up with the wrong solution, you're punished. You come up with the right solution, you're rewarded. And that just excited us. Yeah. You know, good adrenaline rush. <laughs> well, thanks. Other questions? Yes. Sure. When we sold the business, we signed covenants not to compete for five years. And at that point, uh, my partner and I were quite certain that we would get back into the business in five years. And so we said, how do we keep our client base warm? And uh, that, that was an easy one, consult. And so then we spent several months trying to figure out how do you consult, what are we going to do? And uh, we came up with, uh, we'll, we'll consult by evaluating what the businesses are. And at that point, Mystery Shopping was a very small business that most of the big companies today were all emerging back then and sort of starting the same way that we were. And so we, we began uh, by going to all of our clients and signing up m many of them as, uh, as Mystery Shopping clients. And you know, with Mystery Shopping, the essence of the business is uh, you send consumers out to have a regular uh, experience with the business, then they report back, you tabulate the, bus the information, and you provide it back to the business. And so that was sort of a, a caretaker activity that actually grew into its own thing. And it had a lot of very stimulating parts to it that, uh, you know, that were really, really needed in their own right. For example, when we began that business, it was strictly a, a pencil and paper business. Um, you know, we had a computer in the office, but we didn't have multiple computers and they weren't networked. You know, today, uh, the business is all on the internet. You know, it's a paperless office. We went from the, the biggest part of our staff being, you know, clerical and mailroom to not having any, any clerical help. Um, as time has gone on, uh, our five years, uh, you know, came and went. We haven't got back into the business yet. Um, there were times when I would have been willing to uh, jump back in, and now I'm, 
if I had a, a, a son-in-law or daughter-in-law or one of my kids said, hey, Dad, come mentor me on that, I'd still be excited about doing that because there are tremendous opportunities out there in all kinds of niche markets that excite yeah. us. But, you know, the mystery shopping kind of took on a life of its own. Good. Other questions? market research for the coupon books before the internet like how did you research that well there were two things that we did um, I flew back to Minneapolis uh, several times during our senior year and uh, visited a variety of, of the types of businesses that we thought would be in the coupon you know would be in a coupon book would, would we want them to be in our coupon book and we couldn't find anybody that was couponing and we found a reasonable receptiveness to the ideas that we were sharing with them. And then uh, I also did trips where I visited with uh, high school organizations. You know, I'd go into the high school and I'd talk to the band and the choir and the football team and the, the DECA and, you know, whatever the groups were. And I'd talk about their fundraising uh, processes, needs, uh, satisfaction, and uh, determined that there was just a things hadn't changed since I was in high school. There's just a huge demand for what we were contemplating doing. And that was the market research. You know, was there demand for the product? Was somebody already, already filling that demand? Now, when we got back to Minneapolis and we actually got involved uh, in the business, uh, we discovered that, that there was competition that we weren't aware of. And actually, there's just one particular piece of, of competition. It was a book called Double Pleasure. And uh, this fellow had started his book the year before. When we went back to Minneapolis, we were thinking about cloning what we had seen here in Utah, which involved uh, cents off, dollars off, um, you know, buy a Big Mac, get your French fries for free or something. In this double pleasure book, everything that was in it was two for one. And when we saw that, uh, we said, oh, we're barking up the wrong tree and uh, we immediately switched over to a two-for-one format which uh, it, it's interesting it's a, it's a different pitch you know you go to a business and you say we want to do this promotional advertising with you you know you put in this minor coupon that, that draws people and all of a sudden they're saying put in this major coupon and so you're you know you're adjusting your spiel to uh, you know to meet the the business reality and so our our initial marketing research solid but not sophisticated and then on an ongoing basis always trying to do competitive uh, you know research to be sure you're state-of-the-art and current you know you don't think that you're the only one out there with a good idea or the ability to figure things out good. other questions go ahead um, in past entrepreneurial lectures we learned a lot about mentoring and mentors uh, as you were creating your business with your partner, did you run into uh, obstacles that required outside help? Did you go to anyone, or even now, do you have someone you talk to that can kind of uh, help you, you know, give you advice on, on entrepreneurial business, things like that? Well, it's interesting. You know, wh when we began, uh, we really just bootstrapped it and, uh, and did what we did. Uh, we didn't have a we didn't have any place near the kind of network of of friends to uh, you know to, to dip into and of course as as life's gone on uh, you know we have lots of friends that you know we constantly bounce ideas off of um, the mentoring has more been on the flip side that uh, we've taken great satisfaction out of you know mentoring the the people that have worked for us and uh, you know as a, that's one of the things that I, I sometimes feel almost a little guilty about in terms of keeping businesses in the the multi-million dollar stage instead of you know trying to grow them into the tens and twenties of millions is that there's not a lot of opportunity for growth and so when when someone comes to work for us they know they're just going to be here for a season and part of what we paid them was really helping them get a vision for their future and understanding what some of life's possibilities would be. And I, I think we've served a lot of people well and got a lot of satisfaction out of doing that. And there wasn't the kind of network um, 
when you were working and starting as there is today. No. Now you can get lecture series, uh, get mentoring programs, and uh, and a lot of people are coming back to the universities to give back. And this is kind of a new phenomenon, really. Well, and certainly the internet changes everything. Yeah, and then the internet and the, and the way you communicate. Yeah, good. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Well. So when you initially started off your business, how did you handle expansion? I mean, you started the two of you with just with just you starting your product, but then then how did you determine when do we hire on more people? How do we it, handle that growth? Well, we actually hired uh, a lot of people before we left BYU. Uh, we hired people before we'd printed our first contracts or our business cards. We'd hired people before we were in Minnesota and signed the first contract. and we considered ourselves sort of early creators of the apex pinnacle model and uh, you know we just went to some of our best friends and said have we got an opportunity for you we're doing this coupon book back in minnesota it'll be sort of like the cougar book that you've seen here we're going to sell it through the high schools we want you to do your summer job back then byu ended its uh, winter semester um, memorial weekend the end of may and we said get out of school, go work someplace for two months, then come to Minnesota uh, the 1st of August and work for us uh, selling these coupon books uh, until September 28th. School normally started here at the Y the last Monday in September. And so we brought back a uh, half dozen plus guys, built it up to maybe a dozen a year that would be our seasonal salespeople that would come out and, and go to all of our fundraising organizations. For them, they made great money. Um, you know, for us, uh, it staffed us without having the the burden of uh, ongoing uh, year-round employees. Uh, we also brought in uh, one of our friends from BYU to work for us for that entire fall semester. Once we got to winter, uh, Brian and I were the business exclusively putting it together until we got to August again, when we had our next crop of of salespeople. Uh, coming out to work for us. It was a good model and it's, you know, it, it succeeded for us the same reason that it succeeds for uh, the companies that are doing it today. You know, we're bringing out just really high quality people like you that are all pre-professionals, pre-graduate schools uh, that are just going to be, uh, you know, stellar employees wherever you go and we have you doing something that typically people of a much lower caliber are doing. And boy, did our school teachers love dealing with you instead of dealing with the, uh, you know, burned out uh, used car salesman in his plaid jacket. <laughs> and it was just a wonderful model. So the, uh, specifically, the growth was really all taking place internally within the company and through the tremendous amount of cash that it threw off. Well, and, and I know you're not saying this, but the way I understand is a lot of the the demand today, especially on, on this campus, many other campuses, is for the return missionaries and the young men. And you utilized that model way back in the 70s, correct? And yep. that, I mean, and, and that's one was a successful factor, yes. is getting these people who were mature and, uh, and dedicated knew how to deal with rejection. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, exactly right. And, and that's why these companies are doing it here. Yeah. It's not to help you make money. It's because you're such fabulous young men and young women that... Uh, just are way overqualified for a really neat opportunity. You know, not something you want to do for the rest of your life, but right. something that can really work for you and the company and the fundraising group and everybody else together. Yeah, and they don't know they're overqualified, so let's not tell them. Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, okay. Uh, a couple more questions. paper that they had to sign what was the purpose of him doing that was he trying to make a contract with them well he went he went to the groups and got them to sign a paper saying I'm going to sell this product if it measures up with yeah, I'm guessing I don't know but I'm guessing he went to McDonald's and said I want to do a happenings book would you be in my book and they said no happenings is enough mm -hmm. well so he said how do I solve that problem you know there's the rejection the entrepreneurial creativity and he said, okay, let's go to the fundraising groups. He now has a stack of letters, and he says, every fundraising group that sold happenings is going to sell me instead. Look at all these letters. Will you be in the book with me? At which point they all said, well, sure, I'll do that. We call those letters of intent, not binding contracts. Yes. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, good question. Any other questions? Okay, let me uh, kind of summarize and you help me. Um, I think today what we learned was uh, from Paul and, and, and his entrepreneurial experience is that entrepreneurs um, have really give a lot of attention to detail. We often think of the entrepreneur as someone who's just very passionate, goes out there like a bulldog and pushes through. But uh, Paul is more typical of the entrepreneurs <clears throat> we actually see, and that is they're, they're very uh, prone to uh, focus on detail. Uh, they're very good at understanding their market and what's going on in the market. Uh, they're very strategic in their competitive reaction. Uh, and I think that's another thing, that uh, when you start a successful company, uh, competitors will come in. And when they come in, you have to outthink them. And, and also, you have to rely on what got you there in the first place. I mean, you had great people. You had a great product. And at the end of the day, all you had to do was continue with those strengths and always play to your strengths. And entrepreneurs are very good at that. They play to the strengths that they have that got them there in the, in the market in the first place. And that really what you did, you stayed with your strengths and continued. And so a lot of good things uh, that we can learn from that. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming today and flying in. And we appreciate your uh, service and your mentoring and uh, being able to volunteer for this lecture series. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay.